Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to my class again for Physical Chemistry for Life Sciences. We are in Chapter 4, Chemical Equilibrium, and today we are going to talk about low Chatelier filter. So, uh, in the previous chapter, or in the previous part of the chapter, we defined what equilibrium is and uh, how do we solve for equilibrium questions. The equilibrium position itself can change uh, just like by looking at this picture here, if you look at the left side, you have two water levels in equilibrium. If you add some water to the left side of, the, of this container, uh, so if you add some water here, the water levels will actually go back to equilibrium after some time. If you take water out from this level, the water levels will, will equilibrium themselves. So this is again, as I mentioned earlier, the equilibrium position can change if you push it uh, towards left to the right. The reaction or the equilibrium will adjust itself to go back to the normal to the normal to the normal situation. Uh, this is actually the principle of Luc Chatelier. Luc Chatelier was a French scientist who studied equilibrium, and he, and he said when a system at equilibrium is subjected to a disturbance, the composition of the system adjusts, so it tends to dent the minimize of the effect of the, the disturbance. So we can see this in actual life, we can see this in the stock markets, we can see this in an economy, and we can see this also in chemical reactions. Before we go further into the Chatelier principle, I just want to raise the fact that the equilibrium constant is constant. It does not change. Even the equilibrium position itself changes. So you have more maybe products or more reactants. The equilibrium constant value, large, the capital K, does not change itself. The equilibrium constant K does only change, it's only a function of temperature. Temperature does affect actually the value of K. Uh, usually when you increase the T, the temperature, K increases. But uh, with any other thing, uh, if you change the amount of the products or reactants, the K itself uh, stays constant. And I will explain, explain this further in the next slides here. Let's first study uh, the presence of a catalyst on the position of equilibriums. Because this is um, because you guys are pharmacists and this is uh, this course is for bio biochemistry people, enzymes are actually a good uh, a good example of catalysts. Enzymes are biological versions of catalysts and not, and are so ubiquitous that we need to know how their action affects chemical equilibrium. The definition of a catalyst, the catalyst is a substance that speeds up the reaction rate by providing a different route. This is what the catalysts do, and we're going to know more about catalysts in the next chapter. But basically, a catalyst is a substance that speeds up the reaction. It makes it faster, finishes in less time, by maybe making, uh, providing another mechanism for the reaction. The issue with the catalyst, the catalyst fasten up, speeds up the rate of the forward reaction, but it's the same thing, the same thing for the reverse uh, route too. And because this is one factor, and because of the fact that delta G itself is a state function, that means the delta G for the reaction is defined in, the diff in, in terms of the difference between the reactants and the products. And therefore, adding a catalyst to the reaction, it might change the delta G star, which is the activation barrier, or the activation energy, but it does not actually change delta G for the reaction, which is the difference between the reactants and products. And therefore, adding a catalyst to any equilibrium won't actually do anything to the equilibrium. The presence of a catalyst does not change the equilibrium constant of a reaction. So again, the equilibrium constant is only a function of temperature. If you change the temperature, the equilibrium constant will change, and probably the position of the equilibrium will change. But adding a catalyst does nothing to the equilibrium. The equilibrium stays as is. As I said, the temperature does affect the equilibrium. And let's take an example of uh, just simply an endothermic reaction, which is melting of water. Melting of water, that means going from solid to liquid. Uh, that's an endothermic reaction. So it has some rate at some temperature. If you increase the temperature, if you heat this reaction up, the rate of the reaction will speed up. So, and the equilibrium will shift to more products. Exothermic reaction is the opposite. Exothermic reaction 
uh, actually increasing the temperature will do the opposite for that. So temperature does affect uh, equilibrium by shifting it to the right and left, uh, as we're gonna explain in the examples to follow. Finally, the effect of pressure and volume. Increasing the volume, changing the volume or changing the pressure of, equilib of, the, of the reaction conditions will actually have an effect on equilibrium. So, for example, let's take this uh, problem here, which is phosphorus solid reacting with chlorine gas to form a phosphorus trichloride liquid. So, if you look at this one here, You have a you have a solid in this in this side. You have a gas and you have a liquid. Changing the pressure and volume only affect gases. If you have a gas in the equation, the the, the pressure and volume will have an effect. If you don't have any gas in the equation, uh, that will have no effect. Because remember, solids and liquids do not actually appear in the equilibrium constant expression, and therefore, uh, changing the pressure or the volume does not actually uh, change uh, the solid and liquid. So this only applies when you have a gas. Now what happened? Let's imagine that we increase the pressure of the system. In this side, you have a gas. On the right side, you don't have gases. The reactants are already pressurized. So when you increase the pressure in this to this side, when you increase the pressure, when you increase the pressure of, of equilibrium, the pressure actually will affect both reactants and products. But since you have no gases in the product side, the pressure will affect the reactants. So that's the disturbance Lord Chatelier talked about. And the, and the equilibrium will adjust itself by moving to more products. So this is how you do chemical problems. If you increase the pressure, you have gases to the right side to the left side. That means the basic the equilibrium will run away to uh, form more products. So increasing the pressure here will lead to form more products. Or in other words, we can say that the, uh, the, the, the equilibrium will shift to the right. Equilibrium will shift to the right. And decreasing the pressure okay. will do the same thing. Will do the opposite. Yes, go ahead. Uh, K changes. The constant K changes no, K by increasing the pressure. That's a good point. K does not change in this case. Because the only thing that changes K is the temperature. And there is no, and we are working here, let's say we are constant temperature. As long as the temperature is constant, K is constant. Now, let me grab this reaction into my whiteboard and stay it further. What we, what, we have, what we are having here is we have P4, which is solid plus some gas, which is six moles of Cl2 gas. And it's in equilibrium with uh, four PCL3 liquid. So first we said increasing the pressure, that means uh, the, the equilibrium will go, will shift. To the right. Imagine with that uh, we uh, increase the volume. So this is in a, happening in a container, let's say it's happening in two liters, and suddenly uh, the volume of this whole equilibrium container changed. So let's say that we increase that volume. As you know, uh, the relationship between pressure and volume is uh, inverse proportion. That means when you increase the volume, the pressure will get decreased. So if you have any problem that uh, 
that uh, involve volumes, you right away think about this as a pressure. So uh, increasing the volume will decrease the pressure. That means decreasing the pressure of the reactants and products, but we have no gases in the products. Well, the moles, the, the Cl2 gas will decrease, and therefore, the equi according to the equilibrium principle, the, uh, the equilibrium will shift to the, uh, to the left. That means you will have more reactants to compensate of, for what is lost. Now, for me, if you want to solve literally problems, I think about it like this. If you have A plus B are in equilibrium of with C plus D. If you change anything, like if you, uh, I think about it this way. Let's say you are increasing A, okay? You increase A, then the equilibrium will, will run away to the right. You get it like that, okay? If you increase B, if you add more B, then also the equilibrium will shift to the right. As long as this is in gases, okay? This is a gas, this is gas, this is gas, and this is gas. If A is solid and you increase A, nothing will happen because solids and liquids do not contribute to the, to the equilibrium. It's only gases who plays a role in this in these problems. Now, what happens if you increase B, P, uh, increase D? What happens if you add more D to this reaction? You add more D, then the equilibrium will shift to the left. E as easy as this. You see, it's easy. What if you decided to remove some of C? So you take some C out. If you take some C out, that means that if the products are feeling disturbance, then the equilibrium will shift to the right in order to compensate for what is lost from C and so on. Temperature effects actually happens the same thing. Let's imagine this is an exothermic reaction. So delta H for this reaction is negative. You learned in the previous chapter that exothermic, that means A plus B, will go to C plus D plus heat. That's what exothermic reaction means. So here, when you want to deal with exothermic or endothermic, you put heat as part of the reactants or products, and this is for exothermic reaction. So for exothermic reaction, if you increase the temperature, that means you are adding more heat, and the reaction will shift to the left. Okay? This is just what I said uh, before, but now it's more clear. If this is endothermic reaction, that means A plus B plus heat, that's what endothermic, right? Uh, goes to C plus D. So heat is part of the reactant now, reactants now. If you increase the heat, if you increase the temperature of endothermic reaction, this is endo. If you increase the temperature, that means you're adding actually heat. It's like adding A, and the equilibrium will shift to the to the right. So this is how you solve. Uh, Look at the problems, and we are actually gonna uh, practice some of these problems very soon. Um, doctor? Yes. I have a question regarding the presence of uh, pressure and volume. Yeah. So when we apply pressure uh, or th change the volume, uh, why does it only affect the reactants, not the products? No, it affects both. It affects so how do we know if, well, if it changes see. the... Let's go back to this example here. So in this example here, the P4 solid, I think, was in this slide here. So uh, the, special, the special case here, uh, Kothar, is that we have no gases in this specific example. We have no gases in the products. So here we have no gases. And therefore, for this specific example, and changing the pressure or the volume, um, the product has nothing to do with it. But if you have a question that says, let's say 2A gas is in equilibrium with 3B gas. Now, changing the pressure or the volume will affect this equilibrium. And it's gonna affect both sides. Let's say if we increase the pressure here. Well, the, the, the pressure will increase here and there, right? So when you're increasing the pressure of a, react, of, 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 of a mixture of species that are in equilibrium with themselves, 
in a container, if you increase the pressure, well, the pressure will, will affect everything. But the pressure in this case will affect these three moles more than these two moles. Because you have more, more moles on the right side than the left side. And who can tell me, in this case, what happens to the equilibrium? It's going to shift right or left? Can you open your mics and tell me if you increase the pressure for this equilibrium? No. Is it going to be shifting it right or left? It will, shift, it will shift to the reactant side. To the left. left. It, it, will will shift. Shift. it will shift to the reactant side. That's right. Let us practice these problems in this course. Doctor, please. Doctor, please, I have a question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, regarding the A, B, C, D uh, 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 equation, okay. you said that if we increase A, what do you mean by that? Uh, we increase the amount increase of the reactor? Increase the concentration, yes. The concentration, okay. Yeah. If A is a gas, then adding A, that means increasing the concentration of A. That, uh, this question here will actually clarify things. I know this is new to you, and it's kind of hard for some people. But this one will actually uh, uh, clarify things for you. Now, uh, before we go further, let's just take an example and practice these questions. I will stop recording again and I will pause the recording to do. In the previous slides, we observed the effect of pressure and volume and temperature on the equilibrium position. Now we understand that increasing temperature on equilibrium actually does have an effect on equilibrium and usually for endothermic reactions, it's going to shift it to the right. For exothermic reaction, it's going to shift it to the left. This can be formulated in the Van Hoff equation. The Van Hoff equation uh, relates different, rate, uh, different equilibrium constant at different temperatures. So if you have a reaction with an equilibrium constant K1 at T1, and T1 changes to T2, so that means you are either, either cooling or heating the reaction. It doesn't matter if you are cooling or heating. If you're changing temperature from T1 to T2, then the equilibrium constant K will change from K1 to K2. To calculate that, you can do this equation, which is ln K2 is equals ln K1 plus delta H over R, and between brackets is 1 over T minus 1 over T2. And these T should be in Kelvin, as we already know in uh, physical chemistry from now. So you can rearrange that equation to in the form of ln K2 over K1 is equal delta H over R, 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. The equilibrium constant of an endothermic reaction increases with temperature, and it decreases with uh, exothermic reaction. Let's practice this in this question. In this question, estimate the equilibrium constant for the synthesis of ammonia at 500 Kelvin from its value at 298 Kelvin, which is 6.1 times 10 to the power 5, for the reaction written as N2 plus 3H2 goes to 2H3. So I'm providing you with an equilibrium constant here, which is 6.1 times 10 to the power 5, has no units at this temperature. And I want you to, add, to calculate the equilibrium constant at 500 Kelvin. So here I'm increasing the temperature and the equilibrium constant will change. Now we need to calculate that change. I'm giving you the sign ethyl formation of ammonia, which is minus 46.1 kilojoule per mole. Now, this is the delta H that we need to use in the equation. Before we do anything else, the only problem with this question is that here we are, the sign ethyl formation of ammonia is defined in terms of one mole of ammonia. But here I'm forming two moles of ammonia. And therefore, delta H that I want to use is actually 2 times the delta H provided. So it's 2 times minus 46.1, which is equal to around minus 90 something. So because of the fact that this is 2 moles of ammonia forming, we need to multiply the delta H provided by 2. So let's proceed with this question. Ln K2 over K1 is equal delta H over R, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1 1 over T1 minus T2. Uh, so don't mess up with this equation. Uh, the K2 over K1 is equal 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. There are other forms of this equation, by the way, and this is one way to write it down. So we'll proceed like as follows. K1 is 6.1 times 10 to the minus to the 5. 
and T1 is the 290 Kelvin, K2 is unknown, and the T2 is 500. And delta H is a 2 times that number, and we get a value for uh, R, which is 8.314. So I'm plugging all the numbers correctly in the equation. Note the negative sign here is from delta H formation, because some of these reactions, you have delta H written in, in terms of minus. But the original equation here, in our case, is a plus. The minus sign in the substitution is because of this is an exothermic reaction. So the minus is not for, from the formula, it's, the, it's from the negative sign of the uh, exothermic reaction. So I'm going to simplify this. I'm just dividing, I'm working these numbers out. So the left side is the same. And I have calculated this uh, term to be minus 5544.9 Kelvin minus 1 times difference in temperature. So I just simplify this in the calculator. And as you see here, the Kelvin minus 1 goes with the Kelvin, and the len side will be uh, unitless as expected, because len is always uh, unitless. And you move on, that will be the len K2 over 6.1 times 10 to the power 5 is minus 15.03. And if you want to take the until len, you put exponential for both sides. So you say e power len something is equal to e power uh, minus 15, and the len goes with the uh, E, as you know, so K2, K2 over 6.1 times 10 to the power 5 is equal to this, E power minus 15.03. This is how you get rid of the length in mathematics. And solving this out, you are going to provide it with a value of K2 is equal to 0 0.18. That means that K has decreased dramatically. It was 6.1 times 10 to the power 5. Now it's only 0 0.2 uh, when you increase the temperature. So increasing the temperature does not always increase the K. This is an exothermic reaction. So actually increasing the temperature is not good for this reaction. Increasing the temperature will uh, lower the equilibrium constant, as, expected, as explained in the previous slide. Now we move on to something else, which is the proton transfer equilibria, which has more applications to you as biochemists. Uh, remember from Chemistry 101, uh, we have some two definitions actually for acids and bases. We have also we have the, the we have the Arrhenius concept that acids are proton uh, donors and, uh, and, uh, and and bases are hydroxide uh, donors. But the better definition is the bronsted lowry ones where acids are proton H plus donors and bases are protons acceptors. An example is the reaction between HCl and water. So if you're acting HCl with water, the, uh, the HCl will be the acid. It will donate an H plus to the water to form the hydronium ion, H3O plus, and the Cl minus. So uh, as you remember from chemistry 101, uh, you have the conjugate acid base pair. So in this reaction, the HCl is the acid, the water is actually the base, and the Cl- is the conjugate base, and the H3O plus is the conjugate acid. You can generalize this equation by writing HA plus H2O liquid goes to H3O plus plus OA minus. So HA again is the acid, H2O is the base, H3O plus is the conjugate acid, and A minus is the conjugate base, as you learned from chemistry 101. The equilibrium constant for this is the activities of products divided by the activities of the reactants. And you can write a similar equation for the base. In this part of the chapter, we're going to uh, dig more into this K, and we're going to name it a special name, which is Ka for acid and Kb for a base. You might know already that the pH is the definition defined as the minus log of H+, and the pOH is the minus log of O concentration of OH minus. And the addition of pOH plus the pOH is equal to 14. So the range of pH goes from 0 to 14, and uh, the neutral pH is 7, uh, a pH of 1 or 2 is acidic, and a pH of 14 or 13 is very basic. And this is how you relate uh, the pH with the concentration of H plus. So let's take this example as uh, quickly. It says death is likely if the pH of a human blood plasma changes by more than 0. Point, plus minus 0. 0.4 from its normal value of 7.4. Blood usually have pH of 
7.4. If you go and do a blood test, usually uh, in the blood test that says that your blood pH is around 7.4. If that pH increases by amount by a little amount, plus 0.4 or minus 0.4, uh, that's gonna uh, pose a, a serious hazard in your health uh, on somebody else. I mean, and that would be very dangerous. Says what is the approximate range of molar concentrations of hydrogen ions for which life can be sustained? So this is a straightforward question. Says the uh, the pH of blood is equal to seven point four. So a change of plus minus point four. That means you can either go to 7.8 or 7 because uh, 7 plus 7.4 plus 4 is 0.4 is 7.8 and 7.4 minus 0.4 is 7. So this is the pH. The question is asking what is the approximate range of molar concentrations of hydrogen ions? So we need to calculate the molar concentration of hydrogen ions out of these pHs. So if pH is 7.8 this is equal to minus log concentration of H plus so we need H plus so the way you do this is first you take get rid of the minus you multiply both sides of the equation by minus so it turns out the log H plus is equal minus 7.8 And if you want to take this log out, you uh, power everything to you take you power everything to ten. So ten log you take the anti log h plus is equal to ten power minus seven point eight. This is how you take rid of the log in mathematics. Okay, and therefore the h plus concentration. is equal to 10 power minus 7.8. And calc in the calculator, this would be a very small number, which is equal uh, to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8 molar, or mole per liter. For the other one, for the other the extreme of the equation, if you have a pH, is equal seven. You can repeat the calculations, and you will find the H plus to be equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus seven molar or more per liter. You can do this at home and by yourself. So this is the range. The range is from this to that. It's 1.0 times 10 to the minus seven to 1.8 times 10 to the minus eight. This is the range of H plus concentration that will keep. Uh, you are alive if the number gets away from out of this range then you're out in this slide he just changing he's writing the answers in terms of millimole so he's dividing uh, those numbers by uh, he's multiplying those numbers by thousands and he gets you uh, uh, the answers in millimole now the pH scale as you might know it goes from 0 to 14 and you have 7 which is a neutral that's pure water Salty water is a little bit uh, more basic. Sea water is a more basic. You have also uh, milk and blood. They have uh, around uh, number, uh, it's almost neutral. But uh, some foods actually and some uh, household chemicals, they're actually uh, acidic. Like vinegar, for example, is acidic. Coffee is pretty acidic. Um, the stomach in your acid, the gastric fluid in your acid, it's, uh, in your stomach is pretty acidic. It's, uh, it has pH around 2. And one mole HCl will have pH of 0. Because uh, the pH is minus log pH plus. So log 1 is 0. And minus 0 is 0. So you can this, you work this mathematics out. And you will find the pH of one mole HCl is equal to 0. Some other chemicals or uh, Things like ammonia, for example, is pretty basic. Ammonia is a base, so it has a pH of 12. And one molar NOH has a, uh, a pH of 14. Now, the pOH is, 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 is defined as minus log OH minus. Okay? 
So if you want to work out, if you want to ask for the pOH, you, you can calculate from the OH minus, or you can actually you can actually calculate from the H plus itself because the pH and the pOH is equal to 14. Just for practice, I want you to do this as homework at, uh, after finishing the lecture. Find the missing information in the following table. I'm providing you with pH, pOH, H plus concentration, OH minus concentration, and uh, I'm asking you to, uh, this is acidic or basic, so you can practice this at home, uh, please, in your free time. Now, uh, let's move on to uh, one more thing, which is the strengths of acids and bases. Now, remember this for this equation, if an acid HA is reacting with H2 liquid or putting an H liquid, that will provide you with H3O+, plus, which is the hydronium ion plus A-, minus, which is the, um, the, the base itself. Now, if H2O is liquid, then the activity of that is 1, and as I said, it does not actually appear in the equilibrium constant, and therefore the K, the equilibrium constant for this, is the activities of products divided, defined, divided by the activity of the reactants, and therefore it is equal to the activity of H3O+, plus, multiplied by the activity of A-, minus, divided by only the activity of HA, because the activity of H2O is liquid is 1, and it, 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 it goes away. Because this is for acid, now the K has a special name. It's Ka for acid. So now instead of writing K, we say Ka. And for this is a, if this is a base, then it is um, Ka. So Ka is always equal to the concentration of H plus times the con concentration of A minus divided by uh, HA. Now we also define something called PK. P in mathematics means minus log. So pH is minus log H. pKa is minus log Ka. pKb is minus log Kb. px is minus log X. So the P in mathematics means minus log. So the pKa is minus log Ka. Now, if Ka is a small number, let's just throw some numbers here. Then the Ka will be big. And you can see this how it goes. Like if Ka is 0 0.05, or let's say for easier, let's say it's 0 0.01. So log 0 0.01 is equal minus 2. And because this is minus log, so minus log 0 0.01 is 2. But if you if you if you change that to zero point zero 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 one, then the log of that number is minus four and the pKa is four. This tells you that As the Ka increases, as the Ka decreases, the pKa becomes higher. It's a very important rule in this chapter that the weaker the acid or the lower the Ka, the higher the pKa. So again, we define that the Ka is equal to the concentration of H plus times A minus divided by the HA. If you have a weak acid, you have a Ka with a with very small value, it's going to be less than 1.1 or 0.01 or whatever, and therefore the pKa is, is high. So for a Ka, for acetic acid, for example, the acid constant for acetic acid is 1.0 1, 1 times 10 to the minus 5. It's a very, very low value, and the pKa for that is 5. That's the case for weak acids. For strong acids, like HCl, HBr, HI, H2SO4, HNO3, and HClO4, and the Ka for them is high. Uh, we're talking about Ka of 1 or 2 or 3 or even 10. And therefore, the pKa is actually in the negative. It's going to be minus 5. How do, we different, how do we know if this is a weak acid or a strong acid? Strong acids are only six ones. This is the strong acids. HCl, HBr, HI. So HF is not with them, and HF is a weak acid. And it is also HNO3, H2SO4, and HClO4. 
These are the strong six assets in uh, this course. Anything else will be a weak asset, and usually it has a KA value of less than one. And what I spoke there applies also to bases. So the KB for a base, uh, it's less than one for a weak base, and it's, stronger, it's higher than one for uh, strong bases. Strong bases include the soluble hydroxide, like sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and magnesium. But ammonia and amines, like ammonia and its derivatives, are weak bases. And I think you've taken organic chemistry and you know now by, by now what amines are. Now, what is the difference between a strong acid and a, a, a weak acid? What do you mean when we say strong acid? Strong acid, like HA, like HCl, for example, when you put it in water, it ionizes completely, okay, to H plus and A minus. So if you put HCl gas in water, it's before you put it in water, it's called hydrogen chloride. It's it's a gas. It's composed of H and Cl connected with covalent bonds. You put it in water, there is no HCl anymore. It, it ionizes completely. It dissociates completely into H plus and Cl minus. It's kind of having like imagine you having a kind of a microscope to look at this, you will find that only in the polar sites you will have an H plus and Cl minus. And actually, uh, this is an, if you, it's, for the HCl cast, it's an equimolar amount, so you have uh, as many H plus and A minus, you have no HA. If you calculate the, if you put the equilibrium constant for this, if you imagine this as an equilibrium, you will have uh, or if you want to write the, 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 the action quotient for this. So Q for this is basically equal to H plus times A minus divided by HA, but HA itself does not exist. It's like almost zero. Then therefore, this Q is so huge, so big. Okay, But that's a different case for a weak acid. For a weak acid, if you have HB, which is, let's say, an acid, a weak acid, if you put it in water, only some of it will dissociate. So if you have that kind of microscope again, you'll have some of H+, plus, you have a little bit of B-, minus, but you have a lot of HB that is not dissociated yet. So if you have acetic acid, for example, even if you put it in water, you will have still acetic acid. A lot of it is not dissociating. And if you write the Q for that, Q for that is equal to, over the K, uh, H plus times A minus divided by HA itself. In this case, you have a lot of HA. And that means you have a small numbers divided by big number. That means the Q is very, is very small. In other words, KA itself will be a small number. This is the difference between strong assets and weak assets. Now, this is a table of some of the KAs for some assets. You can tell which one is weak, which one is strong. The higher the, the Ka, the stronger the acid. The, 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 the lower the Ka, the weaker acid, so on and so on. And you can see here that the BKA is uh, in different, uh, actually, uh, trend here, okay? You can look at this table, you can learn a lot uh, from it. Finally, water itself dissociates. For water, if you water itself, the equation for that is yeah, if you have water, liquid plus water liquid. So I'm reacting water with water. This can lead to that one of the water molecules will take H, will donate H plus to form the H3O plus aqueous. And that will leave the other water to have the OH minus aqueous. If you write the Ka for this, for the situation for, for water, it's the products divided by the reactants. Because since the reactant, since the reactants are in liquid form. They don't appear in the equilibrium constant of water, and therefore we say K is equal to the concentration of H3O plus, or simply H plus, times the concentration of OH minus, divided by 1, because the activity of the water liquid is 1. And we give this a special name, which is KW. It's the equilibrium constant for water, or we call it the association constant of water. 
This one has a special value at 25 Celsius. It has a value of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. This is very, very, very small value. That means basically in water, you have no H plus and no H minus. You have basically water liquid because of the fact that K is too small. And the PKA and PKW, it's minus log the KW, as I said, it's equal, if you do the math, it's going to equal to 40. And from that, we obtain the equation that the PKA plus PKW, PKB is equal to PKW. And the pH and the pH is equal to uh, 14, which is the PKW. Finally, in this uh, lecture, I just want to find the molar concentration of OH minus ions in a certain solution is 0.01 millimole per decimeter cube. So what is the pH of that solution? It's a straightforward question. I'm going to solve it here. So the concentration of OH minus, it's equal 0.01 millimole. That's not mole, that's millimole, decimeter cube. So uh, if I want to change that into a mole per liter, I will just multiply this by 1000. So the, the OH concentration is actually equal to 0 0.01 times 1000 which is equal to 10, I'm oh, sorry, divided by 1,000. So I want to change, uh, so this is a millimole. So this OH minus is a 0 0.01 millimole centimeter cube. I want to change that into a mole per liter, then I divide by 1,000. So the concentration is OH minus is equal to 0 0.01 divided by 1,000, which is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 5. So 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5 mole per liter. Then, because decimeter cube is the same as liter, then the pH, then you can calculate the pH here. He's asking about the pH. You can calculate the pH right away. You can calculate the pOH, which is equal to minus log the OH minus, just one second please, which is equal minus log this number, and you want to find it to be 5. Then the pH plus pOH is equal to 14, and therefore the pH will be equal 14 minus 5, which is 9. That's the answer for this question. It says 9 here. By this, I finish uh, th this chapter and uh, this uh, lecture, sorry, and uh, next time, inshallah, we will uh, complete this chapter and finish it. And uh, thank you so much for listening and have a great day.